Welcome to another episode of the Carry Trainer Higher Line Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Carry Trainer Higher Line Podcast. I'm with my friend Zidu. It's kind of a joke. A moment ago, we for some reason noticed that the name that our recording software gave him said Zidu. Like, that could be like a lot of things. Like, have you seen the new martial arts Zidu? Taekwon Zidu or something? I don't know. That's funny. How are you today? I want you to ride me like a jet ski. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, I need a sip of Does coffee. Does it show my name on the recording? It says Z right now, but um, will it show? It can and it cannot, but I just didn't know why it said Z do. Neither of us put it there, so maybe we got hacked by Zoom and they somebody put it in there. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> so you and I were talking the other day, and the conversation I believe started around somebody posting some stuff on social media. And the, the poster was discussing that basically a firearm is the great equalizer, which I think is true. It does equalize a disparity of force, but I don't remember the exact wording, but the person writing who has a large following was making a generalization that like the gun is what you need for self-defense, like nothing else really mattered. Remember that post we were looking yeah. at? And so I know you and I chat often. We see police involved shootings or all of these caught on tape videos where people deploy deadly force when it's really not necessary. Like you and I use the drunk uncle at the Thanksgiving dinner. Yeah, he's belligerent, but should you shoot your uncle? So you're a brown belt in Brazilian jiu jitsu. Z do bow to your sensei. So you've got a lot of a lot of experience, both on the mat and in uh, the real world of controlling subjects without having to kill them, right? Yeah, yeah. So let's just have that chat. You know, let's just let's just go for it. Well, let's talk about the statement that the gun. And I'm not quoting anybody. I'm just, in general, the statement, the gun is the great equalizer for self-defense. I mean, think about the word equalize. Like, that means equal the amount of force that is presented to you. Right, right on. So, so if they have a, a bigger mass destruction weapon, then it's not the great equalizer. You know what I mean? It may be the typical equalizer for, for what most people are the most deadly thing that most people can get their hit their hands on in the U S but, uh, I think people will rely on it too much, honestly, too much. And it puts them in a bad situation. And I'm sure with all the classes you've taught and, and the, the classes that I've taught and the people we've been around in the industry, I'm sure you've come along some people that shy away from other techniques to defend themselves besides uh, uh, gu using of the gun. Would you say that you've come across people like that? The question, just so I'm understanding, is that people are happy just to carry a gun and not look at anything else. That's basically what you're saying? Yeah, and, and happy, but are they just dependent upon yeah. those gun skills? And they and then they shy away from anything other than that. And they think yeah. they great eliminator when it comes down to it's like it's a black and white situation all the time right right i think it's like hey somebody's gonna try to kill me and then i'm gonna pull my gun out and shoot them but, the proverbial if you have a hammer every problem's a nail kind of a analogy i think that that goes both ways too so yes i agree with you there are many people that put a gun on in my opinion and think that they are prepared to deal with violence and what we're saying, listeners, is that you're prepared to deal with one type of violence, which is, which is the type of violence that requires deadly force. So you, you had better be able to articulate that you were in fear of death or great bodily harm. If it was a, a good example, that video you and I've seen and many of you listeners or viewers have seen, a uh, husband pulls up to a 
convenience store. Was that Florida? It was about three, four, five months ago. Parks in a handicapped parking space. His wife and I believe kid was in the car. Gentleman, male asshole, pulls up next to the car and starts yelling at the woman, you don't have handicap license plates. And he's giving her the what for out in front of the quick mart. The husband walks out and done the same thing I probably would if somebody was screaming at my wife when I walked out of the store and walked up and was like, what the hell's going on? And the guy got in his face and he just checked him. The guy trips, falls over, draws his pistol from the ground and murders the guy. He outright murdered him because his only solution, that guy clearly was itching to get in a fight. You could just, the fact that he's screaming at somebody about a handicap space, but I think it illustrates, I mean, if you push me over, I have a million options. I can roll over and get up and run off into the night. <laughs> you know, I don't have to shoot you. And, and the fact that that guy just was standing there, he didn't aggress on him and try to put the boots to him. He didn't pull a bat out. He didn't draw a gun out. He just pushed the guy over and the guy tripped and was like, oh my God, it's on the moment I've been waiting for. I think there's a couple things that we could discuss about that scenario, but. Yeah, that, I remember that. And, uh, you know, it came out that he did get charged with, with something. I don't know what they I think him. it was murder. I think they charged him with murder. Let me look that up real quick as we're talking. Right. Yeah, and to me, it's like maybe in that guy's mind, and I'm just, you know, throwing something out there. Of course, I don't know all the facts. And I definitely don't know what was in that guy's mind, but he, I bet he was somebody that probably relied on that gun and was like, ah, shoot, you know, I go out with my grandpa or whatever. Maybe he trained with, with Mick, carry trainer. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But, uh, and he was waiting for that moment and maybe that's what he has trained or visualized in his head and whether right or wrong, he visualized it. And when that, opportunity arose he he executed what he's he's been thinking in his head for some time probably so what so this is horrible i'm reading this right now uh he was not charged due to florida stand your ground law and this is the problem with these kinds of laws not that it gave him the right to do that the problem is is that laws are always open to interpretation and what if that was one of our wives that got pushed on the ground versus a grown man? And I'm reading it here. He wasn't charged. He, he, uh, See? based on the laws there, he killed that man. The sheriff said his name was Dre Dredjka. Dredjka would not be arrested or charged with the crime, saying his actions fell within the legal boundaries of Florida's stand your ground law. In an expansive 30-minute news conference, he tried to explain, explain how the law connected to what was going through the man's mind when he pulled the trigger. Dredjka felt after being slammed to the ground, the next thing he was going to be further attacked. So that's that comes down to that. Just because you can articulate you were in danger, had that man really been trained, he probably would have known he wasn't in a deadly force encounter, right? Yeah. Or he would have uh, – maybe, honestly, I think that many people in that same situation, despite the context that we see in that video or what we can assume, I think a lot of people in that situation would have feared for their life potentially. Yeah. Or would have – their adrenaline would have shot up to that and they would have went into that black, um, that fight, flight, or freeze – because they haven't exposed themselves to situations of that nature, right? And uh, so thinking it from that standpoint, I mean, it's hard to prove. I mean, I, I, they had to in court. It's hard to prove that somebody uh, would not have the composure or they lack the training or whatever to have the composure to be, uh, to make a, a reasonable decision in that, in that scenario. Mm -hmm. But I think if he'd been exposed to maybe grappling or if he's been in a fight before or if he goes trains and trains where people are, are being uh, combative with each other, such as jujitsu or anything at the gym where you're just exposing yourself to that stuff, I don't think he would have reacted as he did. Even though 
whether or not he trained or not, it's kind of emotional when you get pushed down and you're faced with uh, a co some conflict, some real world conflict like that. It can stir you up emo emotionally, which is different from just competition or training, right? But I think he would have been a little more composed, a little more reasonable in his reaction if he had been trained which that begs the question then if he had been trained would he have been screaming at a woman in a parking lot you know that's the other like once you get to that point where you know then when you know usually those people are understanding geez i know the consequences i know what another man can do to me based on my training thus i will not in instigate a situation like that i'm looking at it again because i thought did he end up getting charged later? I'm looking at a news article from like July or August. No, I'm looking at the video again because the stand your ground, assuming like that the guy was still uh, coming towards him aggressively after he pushed him. It looks like in the video, well, he pulled his gun and then the guy kind of backed up. So it's hard to tell. The guy started walking forward a little bit, and then he seen the guy going for the gun, and then he started backing up. So once he started backing up, in my opinion, why do you need to shoot him at that point? Yeah. I think you're... He's not anymore. Is he pulling a gun? Right? Your point about that you said a moment ago about um, the training is really the big issue. So many guys... We, you and I see this constantly. How many people do I know personally that own guns? Hundreds. Like most of the people I associate with own guns. How many of those people have ever come to train with me? Not like, hey, you should come train with me, but just said, hey, I know you're going to the range or gone with my brother who was a serviceman or gone with you. Like zero. I'm exaggerating, but it's like one out of a hundred people we know actually go like your friend, Paul. You know, Paul's a good example, got a job and he's not, he, he's got a family busy and all that, but he makes time to go grapple with you and learn some things that were never part of his, his, uh, sphere of life, right? It's all new stuff to him. Yeah. And I think when you start to train, then you realize how much you really don't know. Like it's a rabbit hole of sorts, right? Like it could be it could be nonstop. Well, now I need to learn long range precision rifle. And now I need to learn how to build a fire in case my car, you know, you just keep, yeah. keep going and going and going. It like, it plants a seed in your head of, uh, possibilities or even probabilities. And, and then it, it builds that fire inside of you. Um, that causes that hunger and really opens your eyes to your ignorance. We all, are ignorant to some degree, right? We don't know some things and we've never been exposed to those things. And right. it's important to get out there and and because you see the things going on in this world and you see the potential for violence and evil, despite it never happening to you, maybe you're, out, you're a little blind to that because it just hasn't happened to you yet or you haven't been in those situations. So go to training, whether you think you need it or not, and see to spark something mm -hmm. and gives you uh, a new perspective on what your limitations are for one, which I think every man needs to know. We need to be honest with ourselves and know what's our limit, right? That way we can, we can better navigate life. And then also let you know how strong you truly are, right? Because some people sell themselves short and you see that a lot. I, I, look, I see it dripping over guys Sometimes when I look at them in their eyes and I and we communicate with them and uh, for a, a long period of time or a day or so, you see that there's a there's a lack of confidence um, just just spilling off of them to some mm -hmm. degree, mm -hmm. to some degree. And you like and and to me that to me that burns in me like no, you're you're as capable as any man out there or woman. You're as capable. You need to know that. I want you to know your limitations, honestly. Say, hey, well, you know what? I've got this bad knee or I've got this whatever. So I'm limited to what I can do, but I know that I can at least do this. Yeah. 
this is within my uh my realm of 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 uh activity or ability right not to sound corny or talk out of my depth it, what you just talked about uh, i think is that probably the impetus what am i capable of you there's a new uh series on it's either netflix or amazon prime and they chronicle and do many documentaries on medal of honor winners oh yeah, yeah. i've seen that i haven't watched that? it but i've seen the. I, I watched a couple of them it's hard to watch like a lot of it because it's so freaking sad you know these because most of these guys were awarded these medals posthumously but you each and every one of them when you watch it's like all right uh john smith uh poor farm kid from Iowa left at 17 to join the Navy during uh, you know, a week after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And they show a picture of him and he's some skinny little dude. And then you read about what he did running through the burning rooms, dragging friends out and, and such. And none of these people are, uh, I shouldn't say none of them, but most of the stories are not john smith everywhere he went everybody knew he was a badass and everybody yeah. knew that he was the the heisman trophy uh, uh uh hopeful you know for the college he went to they were just normal like audie murphy you know the guy that was the most decorated dude in in u.s history was just a little little tiny dude from texas that who's had no dad uh helped raise his brothers and sisters after his mom died and did amazing things so to, I just to your point, and you're right, I, that bothers me, probably bothers you and I, and we probably recognize it because we've been that guy. So mm -hmm. I'll see dudes like that, and I don't say anything in person, but I'll put my arms around a guy on the line and whisper in his ear, you know, like cut that shit out because it's like you can't, you can't go anywhere when you're beating yourself to death. You're right. not going to – you're not. I, I, I just had a guy send me an email this morning and it was actually he was watching our video from uh dover a couple years ago he's got a youtube channel i'm not calling you out if you're watching this but i i i uh um uh, reading the email he just said hey i'm in this area i saw the video with you and z it was freaking awesome and and then he he like made like five references to beat himself up you know like hey if you could find it in your time to respond to this email i'm just a poor dumb idiot hillbilly and you know like this push putting himself down and then talked about some of the stuff going on in his life and it was laced with self-deprecation in a way probably to because he didn't want to sound arrogant but you don't write that stuff if you care about yourself kind of off topic but you have no, no saying. well off topic or not you know i would you and I do a good job of saying what we feel and being genuine with it and, and then bringing things back in. So I don't mind getting off topic with you. I think that's, I think that's why I am so passionate about the hand to hand stuff because I have been that guy that asshole clinched and was relying on just my persona of toughness uh, to get me through in life before, you know what I mean? Like I thought I was tough and I've been an athlete um, and had physical capabilities, but they don't necessarily mean you can defend yourself, especially right. somebody that knows is trained in that. Right. And I, I learned early on in my military career that just because I, I'm tough and, and strong doesn't mean that I can win all the battles. Right. And, and that was a, uh, an ego check for me. You know, I had to develop some humility and I hated that that I couldn't, that I knew that there was people around me that had more capabilities than I did. And I hated that, that being at their mercy. Tell the story real quick. You've told it before in the podcast about, I, I think it was, uh, I think it was once you had joined the army and you were doing some training and some man basically yeah. ran rough, ran rough shot over. <laughs> yeah. I think it, and I was in the infantry for six years before I, I joined or went to selection, went to special forces and all that. And uh, so I got through most of my career in the infantry without, because you do a thing in the army, in the infantry anyway, it's typically called pitting. It, it's essentially just rolling or grappling out in the grass. And there's no real rules. Sometimes you'll start on your knees. Sometimes you'll start standing up and you just go until basically one guy gets muscle failure while the other guy's in a dominant position. <laughs> 
either rape choking you or something like you, know, <laughs> you don't even know what you're doing sometimes. <laughs> and it was before combatives was real big, at least in my unit. And I think it, it's probably my fourth year in the infantry or something like that. I got somebody got a hold of me and they had some experience wrestling and some uh, jujitsu experience and I was by all measures by the eye I thought that I could whoop this guy, right? But bigger, he, bigger, stronger, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. And this guy got me down and like I was exhausted. And I was thinking in my head, I remember thinking in my head, as soon as I get up, I'm gonna whoop your ass. And then I like later on I was reflecting on that and I'm like, as soon as I get up, right. Well, what if I don't fucking get up? You know what I mean? And what does that mean? Like he might just put me right back down. Like I gotta be able to maintain right. it. You know, if I gotta let me get as soon as I get to my gun, I'm gonna kill you. Yeah, you know, I I didn't like that feeling. And it opened my eyes. And I was such a hard head that I didn't it took that to change my my thinking i because you know most of us if you're a type a personality and you consider yourself fairly tough or whatever like you're not one to go seeking help for your weaknesses you're like oh, i don't need that you know so thank god that i figured it out somehow and most of my biggest lessons in life i had to figure out the hard way so that was just another one and after that i swore to myself i was like because I, th I really thought deeply about it. I was like, if I get, if a man held me down with criminal intent in his mind, or say I went to jail, which was a possibility when I was younger, <laughs> prison maybe, and and a man held me down because he had the technique, and I got so exhausted, and we all know, we've heard the quote probably, uh, fatigue makes cowards all men, and I found it to be true because I've been fatigued to that level where I wanted to quit, right? And... I would probably quit and then uh you know what if you wanted to rape me if you wanted to kill me if you wanted to kill my family in front of me that's probably what would happen i mean i'm sure i'd have some little spurts of energy here and there but if you just wrecked me yeah <laughs> probably turn just enough energy to turn them on a little bit more i don't know real quick before you go too far so you're the you made a comment Ego, my interpretation, ego stops men from going to seek help because then they're admitting that they need help and that they're not tough enough. And I think that's precisely why 90% uh, of gun owners aren't training more or average people aren't because you don't want to look foolish right. and you don't want to look like, like you don't have your shit together, and, which is the exact opposite of what we should be. Right. I don't know this, so I, in order to know it, I've got to go sort it out. Right. And it's, it's like the, the fear of being vulnerable or knowing that you have a weakness is so great, especially within men. I can speak on men better than I can anybody else because I am a man, right? But the fear of learning that truth and it being something that you're not proud of or, or showing you some kind of weakness overtakes the logic of hey if you haven't done something you're not going to be good at it which is just logical like if if you have a gun and you've shot it maybe 100 rounds throughout the five year period that you've owned it do you think you're going to be very good with a gun do you think that those right. skills just just maintain or maybe you know whatever the case may be like everybody that is good with something prepared to be good at it right they prepared ahead of time they don't just become good at it so it's nothing wrong with being not being good at something right like you were telling hey, nobody me just, that, go ahead the, uh, the, the, i was gonna the, say the nobody nobody wakes up nobody wakes up no, no, no. yeah like right. oh i'm a executive chef for a four-star restaurant or yeah you right and nobody get. and nobody that's ever been an executive chef at a four-star restaurant stops doing it for a period of time prolonged time and then goes back right to that level either right so right. that tells you right there even the best of the best if they don't maintain that that work ethic and that the time they put into their craft they're still not going to be that good they're going to fall down the ladder rungs yeah. you know however much depends on the time and how much they go away from their craft completely but you know what i'm saying so it's just it's just logic like just be real with yourself. Like, if I don't do something, 
I'm not going to be very good at it. Don't expect to be very good at it. All right. So, and then when you come to an instructor or you come, somebody comes to one of our classes and they look at us and they're like, man, you know, and I've had people tell me, you know, you're kind of intimidating or whatever because of my, what they assume from my credentials or background or what they see on the outside, which is understandable. I do the same thing with people. I see people and I'm, you know, we all do that. We look each other up and down and try to figure out each other and see if that's a mm-hmm. challenge to us, our egos or whatever. But I, w- I really want to impress upon them all that. All that doesn't matter. What matters is you're going to put in the work today. And, and, you, and you heard it too. Somebody shoots and they shoot bad. They're like, uh, immediately what's going out of their mouth? Well, you know, I haven't been, you know, it's been a while since I pulled this whole thing out. And you're like, and I tell them right, right away when I hear that, I'm like, stop. Like, you don't have to tell me that. I understand. Like, if you don't shoot, I, you're not expected to be good. It's not like I'm sitting here being disappointed and you're like, oh, mm-hmm. look at you. You came right. to a class to learn and you can't even shoot good. Like, that's why we're here, bro. Like, you can't. I'm, go- you I'm going practice. to a class this weekend as a student and I'm going to take my little SIG 365. Yeah, you tell me. And, and uh, somebody commented to me online. I know the guy and I'm not busting his chops, but he's like, take a full size gun. This class is all about speed. And I've taken a course with this guy before, Gabe White. Great shooter, master, master class shooter that shoots from concealment. And Gabe, um, not about gay, but this guy's like, dude, just take a full size gun, you know, do a good job, get the get like an award in class. I'm like, I'm not going there to get an award. Like, I want to run fifteen hundred rounds through that gun in a couple of days. Like, I would never do it otherwise by myself. So to sit there on the line and do this guy's course, like that's like that's why I'm there. And I'm gonna pr- probably be way slower than half the guys that are running outside the waistband stuff, but I wore a freaking hole in my tummy the other day. I've been practicing the last couple of days just so I'm safe. Wore a hole in my finger just because it's a little tiny gun, but yeah. yeah. You, don't, you don't show up to like do good. I have S12 coming up. I get an email once a day from people that are now not once a day, once a week from people coming and they're like a lot of questions. And if you read the question, they're like gear related and like, Hey, what should I be training before I come? It's like, dude, this is not, uh, like it. I mean like, yeah, there's things. Yeah. Like there's, yes. Make sure you can safely draw your pistol. Make sure you know how it works. Make sure like that kind of stuff. But they're like, like looking to how do I keep from embarrassing myself is what they're asking. Yeah. It's, and that's what it is. Yeah. That's what it is. And it's like, well, keep in mind, you're coming here to learn. So if like, I'm going to like sit here and like, I've told people go watch the footage from the last one, go watch our, the courses that we've got up online, like the one from Dover and you can kind of see, but you're coming to learn. Like, you know, it's like, Hey man, I'm not going to come to the movie, but tell me what the movie's all about before I get to the movie. Like, yeah, yeah. Go, go to the movie, dude. Shut up. And I understand it, you know, like, but like you said, like, I think you and I, just based off of our experience in this industry or or, our our life up to this point, and it's it's different levels for every man, but we get to a point where I like to build my self-esteem. We all do, right? We want something that makes us feel good, but... There's certain levels to it, levels to everything, and I'm sure you've heard that. And some of us don't need that that input for our self esteem yeah. to that degree. Maybe yeah. though you're at a point now where you feel comfortable enough in your shooting, like you know that, hey, I know what I'm capable of. I know that sometimes I shoot better than I do at other times, but I got a consistent level that I'm pretty good and I feel comfortable with my level and I'm not worried about winning awards or something that's building my self-esteem or my ego in this class. I'm going to literally learn or put myself through the reps with this gun. So I know that I'm capable with this gun and I've got my process consistencies Mm -hmm. in place that I want if I'm going to be carrying this gun. That's all you're thinking about is what, what I, what I get from you, Mick. And I think some people are more like they don't do that as often or put themselves out there as often. So they don't have that, that regular, uh, self-esteem level so these things are kind of like they're builders along mm-hmm. the way i don't need that little builder right now or or at this point in my life yeah um just to win something like that i just go out and do it and i understand the benefits of just going and doing something mm-hmm. versus trying to make sure i don't 
uh, that I that I whoop everybody or or whatever, put unnecessary stress on myself. Yeah. Or where, and I mean, of course, we're all worried about embarrassing ourselves. You don't want to be unsafe. You don't want to, you know, be a jackass. But you you know that you put yourself through the motions and the repetitions to get to the point where you, you won't do that. But you're not necessarily trying to be the grand champion of every fucking thing. Right. Because that's not your focus right now. And that's, I always comes back to that. What are you trying to do? What's your focus? What's the goal? I had a guy ask me yesterday, uh, I, I'm in college. I can't afford ammo. I can't afford to go to the range. What can I do? I was like, well, what's your goal, man? If you're trying to become like the world speed shooting champion, you're probably screwed if you can't afford ammo. If you're trying to protect yourself, then if you can afford one 50 round box of cheap Walmart ammo every month, then make every 50 rounds count and then have yeah. a plan. So like, what's the, the goal always? comes down to so like in this discussion i what we started out chatting on is should you shoot should you not shoot when is a gun not not so much when's a gun the necessary evil the gun's a necessary evil when you're in grave bodily harm or in danger of it or death and that situation we just discussed there's so many things we could talk about that in that like you're talking about uh at some point in evolutions of, of a man, some guys want to like be better than everybody. I know I will never be able to whoop every man I come in contact with. It'll ne I never in my life. Could I never will I? And maybe if when I was like 10, I purposed myself to do that. Maybe there would have been like a brief window where I could have vested any man I came in contact with, right? Because then we start to decline and there's somebody that gets better than you. So I just know I never will ever have that ability. So I train with the firearm. But more importantly, I train to be aware so I don't walk up and push some guy on the ground needlessly. Maybe it could have just been like, dude, back off. I'm getting in the car. Peace out. Because once you – I know and you know that – you don't know when you push somebody what they're going to do. You saw me freak out one time after having some beers because, but you didn't know I was going to do that. Right. So you have no idea. I grew up with a kid. I don't want to say his name, but he had a pretty tough life like you and I as a child. And he was sleeping at our house. He was two or three years older and me and another guy, um, I was the youngest. They were like 16, 15, and I was probably 12 or 13. And we're being hooligans, smoking cigs, and, you know, just being idiots. And we're in uh, the basement at my parents' house, and this guy's sleeping on the couch. So I don't know why we did it. I went and grabbed a thing of lipstick out of my sister's bathroom, and we're starting to put lipstick on this guy. And he woke up grabbed me by the throat and he was a strong he was a strong dude and i'm like ah. and when i was 13 i was probably five feet tall 100 pounds tops i was a scrappy little tiny dude picks me up off the ground and is just full rage and he's now got lipstick all over i can still see it man it was like cycle his lipstick all over his face <laughs> My buddy and I, we get him off of me and we retreat to my bedroom. He breaks my door off the hinges. Now, my parents are upstairs. He doesn't give a shit. He I'm just gonna, lost his mind. Yeah, I am going to murder. And he's telling us, I am going to murder you. He, he, and it's an uh, old hollow core door. He literally grabs the top edge and pries it in. The door folds in over the lock. And my buddy and I are against the door. And we're laughing. When the door breaks, we realize, like, holy shit, like, he's going to, like, I don't know what we're going to do. My dad starts yelling, you know, whatever you idiots are doing, cut it out. And it, that kind of made him like, oh, parents. And he defused. But I never would have put lipstick on him. I thought he would have woke up and been like, look what you idiots did to me. I didn't know that response was coming. You and know you're going to get murdered for it. <laughs> yeah, that day I kind of, like, learned, like, you have no idea what, when you push somebody and I know too many people that are, are, they use this idea of like, I'm a free American. I, 
if you're talking to my wife like that, you deserve to be pushed down the ground. That may be, but in whether or not that guy's legal in doing it, you have no idea what the consequences of your actions are. So is it an equitable trade for you? Because that guy probably had a little ego. I'm, I'm commenting on a, a deceased man, but... I would want to push somebody if I walked out and they were yelling at my wife. But I, knowing me, I'd probably be like, dude, back the F off. I'd look at my wife and say, what's going on? And she'd be like, oh, my God, I was calling you on the phone. You didn't come out, guessing. And I'd get in the car and back away and just be like, screw you, dude. Because it's right. not – it's going to go to that point. You push somebody. If somebody walked up and pushed you to the ground, what would you do? Uh, I don't know. It depends. And that's, that's also – depending on the mood and what's going on in my life at that point in time, which I think some people, they want to roll the dice and, and do things that they think are, 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 are do something in a situation like that because they think that it's not likely that this person will do anything more than, you know, cuss at me and, you know, back down. But then you get somebody like in that situation, that video of that guy in Florida, he got pushed down and immediately drew his gun and, st and shot. Mm-hmm. I'm sure that guy wasn't thinking that was what was going to happen. You know right. what I mean? Probably didn't. And maybe if he was sat and thought about things, he would have thought about it, but he did something out of kind of emotion, kind of the, the uh, machismo that we have in those situations that men have a lot of times. We want to, oh, I'll show you who's boss. Yeah. And you're not, and you're, you're gambling on, you know, the, the scenario that he's going to just back down and you're going to be the big dog in this. And in that situation, it was different. You know, that guy had something else in mind and he pulled a gun. The, there's so many things that we could discuss, like the nuances of that. And it, it always comes back to me to the goal. So if your goal is to live a long, full life and not get shot, killed, or stabbed and not have your family get shot, killed, or stabbed, then the plan should always come back to that. If the goal is to show other men you're tough, or to not be the guy that gets punked out, or uh, to win, then you are, in in order to not be the guy that gets punked out, to win, or to be like the toughest dude, you are engaging in activity that is, by its very nature, capable of not having you live a long, full life. It's just, it's it's like when you're that kind of person, you definitely do not have a mindset to survive and thrive your mindset is still a teenage boy in my right. opinion still trying to somewhat whether it be in your subconscious or not you're trying to prove yourself to some degree mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and you're looking for those opportunities yeah right i used yeah. to do it you know in high school go to parties drink beers and like who can i fight <laughs> or whatever mm -hmm. look at me and my buddies you know make a scene with mm -hmm. all right why right well, Looking back, how the dumb is it? It's like, man, these dudes are freaking assholes, man. That's me yeah. pulling my hair over my ear. <laughs> it's, 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 uh, it, I'm assuming the people listening to us are going to totally agree because they've, if they're listening, they've already listened to where we're coming from. I think it's very important, especially for dads, they teach their boys to have this temperance. I didn't have it as a young man. My son is not like this, although I've seen him flash anger before in various situations. <laughs> we were at an apple orchard. I'm not, I'm not breaking bad on my son. We're in an apple orchard this year. His sister's a very pretty young lady. In this group of 20-somethings come walking by us. We're like sitting outside eating uh, donuts and coffee and stuff. And one of them looked my daughter up and down, and I didn't see it. My son goes, what's up? And I'm like, oh, you know those guys? And he goes, I don't know them. And, and then he said, I, I go, oh, why, I'm like, why are you yelling at him? He's like, he said it loud. He's like, because that dirty perverts can't keep his eyes off of Lucy. And I'm like, well, dude, like, like, take it easy. And the kid, like, looked, like, kind of embarrassed. And then he looked again, and and Andrew, like, said to him, he's like, something like, you know, like, take a picture, you know, something stupid. <laughs> I, I laughed. I go, I've never heard you, you know, get aggressive like that. And his testosterone levels are boosting, which makes it worse, you know, like two bucks busting heads or rams. And the, these kids were harmless. But I talked to him later. I said, well, you know, first of all, your sister's a pretty girl. The kid didn't say anything. He didn't, like, you know, lick his lips or whistle. Yeah. So 
He wasn't it is, crude. It's nat- yeah, it's natural for a young man to look at a pretty girl, just like a buck is going to look at a doe out in a field. So I said, I'm not. He's like, so it's okay? I said, no, it's not that it's okay or not okay. I go, what's not okay is you starting a fight with a complete stranger while we're out here with nieces and nephews. And he goes, I didn't start a fight. I go, you had no idea. I, I had a guy I grew up with that if you would have pushed his button like that, he'd have got up and just started a full-on fist fight over it. Just to, like on his ego check. Nobody tells me I can't look at random chicks outside a – you know, in a donut cafe. It's just, but to the to the point, uh, what we're talking about, what skills then should a person be investing in? And the funny thing is, every time you and I talk, it always comes down to the mindset stuff. And still, there has to be some physical skills to support that, because even if you've tried to de-escalate, tried to get away, or you can't get away, uh, where does somebody start? So, I come to you, I've got some basic uh, physical abilities, and I'm like, hey, man, I just want to be able, if somebody puts their hands on me, not to end up crumpled on the ground. How do I begin? Well, uh, one thing I'll be going over in that fight camp that I'll be, uh, I have going on uh, in January. Quick plug and, uh, for that. If you guys haven't checked it out, Z's got a fight camp going on. It's four months long, right? Yeah, one, one weekend a month. One weekend a month, you only have twelve spots, so it's pretty. Uh, it's a pretty unique opportunity. And what do you have? Like four or five openings left. Yeah, I think four. I I foresee that get turning into something huge in the future for you. I know you're too small on purpose. Yeah, well, right now you know, not to you know, go too far into that, but I had guys that have shot with you and I, mm-hmm. and. And, you know, we're preaching what we're talking about right now. I'm like, you know, there's more to it than just pulling this gun and shooting. And they listen. You know, they said, all right, you know, Z wouldn't be telling me this shit if he didn't believe in it. And let's mm-hmm. let's put it to the test. And most of these guys that are students that are coming are guys that I've, I've taught in some sort of firearms class. And mm-hmm. they're like, there's more to it because they've realized that the, the gun is not the end-all, be-all, right? They want that capability. They want to be able to equalize the amount of force that other people have access to, which is guns. But that's not always a scenario. That's, that's highly unlikely. Yeah. Most of the time. Right. Yeah. Um, so I, I derailed you. So you started, yeah. I just wanted to make sure people knew what you were talking about. Yeah. So what I like to teach guys at first is all principle based. And I, like you t- mentioned earlier, I'm a brown belt in, uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and I was an MMA fighter and I dabbled in all the, the martial arts that are involved in MMA. Um, But I I broke it down for the layman because what I see in the gyms a lot is guys coming in there and they have to fall into classes with just every kind of background uh, if you don't have an advanced and a beginner's class separated. And you're just like showing them like, all right, this is an arm bar from the ground. And like, but they don't even know. They're just basically you're showing them a technique and they don't understand the context. They don't understand how you yeah. get there. And that was the same way in the Army, in the combatives program. They got these techniques you drill like crazy, but people could show you. I could like talk you through every, all the minutiae of that, that technique, doing it slow, like I'm teaching it to you. But then when guys had to apply it, like in their, their rolling or grappling at some percentage of their, their maximum, they, they can't get in that position ever because they don't understand all the principles involved and the body control, right? So that's what we start off with. And some of the basic things you teach guys is like um, the tilt principle. Like some people, you, if you've seen a fight, you've seen a guy square up and he starts swinging and then another guy knows how to get control of the hips and he picks this guy up and this guy's still trying to swing, but he's the other guy's controlling his hips and slamming him at the same time. Well, he didn't readjust his base and realize that when you get pushed, if you don't readjust your base, you will tilt over and you will be off balance. And then anything you do from that point on offensively, Mm -hmm. it's not going to be very good. You might get lucky, but it's very likely that anything you're doing offensively is not going to work at that point because you're, you don't have the position. So diminish, diminish platform. Right. Right. Just like like shooting shitty, shitty grip on a pistol. Right. Yeah. You might get one good shot off. But then after that, you're adjusting 
or you're correcting something. Same thing with punching boxers I, because we talk about grappling and I, and I really illust- try to illustrate the point to the guys that prefer striking more or more trained in striking or boxing. I'm like, look, position before submission, you have to get control of somebody before you just grab an arm and do what you want. Um, yeah, you can get lucky sometimes with maybe a drunk guy that swings and you can do the quick uh, hyperextension of his elbow that hurts, but probably not going to stop them if they really right. mean mean harm. The same thing with boxers. Like a boxer don't just go me and you square up to each other where we're in punching range and just punch at each other, right? Boxers move. They're all about moving and getting an angle. That way I line you up with my power hand or I get you over committing and out of position. That way you're susceptible to my counter punches. It's all about position. It's mm-hmm. all about position. So we talk a lot about, you know, what keeps you in position. What keeps you in position, keeps you in the fight to be offensive, right? And that means you're learning your tilt principle, learning how to base, learning how to maintain balance as you're dealing with somebody, learning how to manage space between you and I, because sometimes if I'm a cop and you're trying to get away, I don't want space between us. I want to take up that space because I got to get control of you. If you're a man that's trying to just attack me out of nowhere, maybe I don't want space. I don't want to take you to the ground unless, you know, that's what I decided to do. I want to get away from you. Maybe you're bigger. Maybe you got a knife. Now I want to get away from you, but the whole time I want to maintain mobility by having a good base and then, and then you know, uh, get a good position, whether that be far away from you, close into you, to your left, to your right, behind you, whatever. What is the simple concept of a base mean? A base just means a stable platform or position that enables you to remain mobile or if you're on the ground, remain gives you uh, the ability to get back up quickly. Right. So that's your base and you use and there's a lot of terminology out there. But for simplicity, I say base just meaning that in general. But then we talk about posting like I post one hand on the ground and I post the opposite leg on the ground. That way I can maintain mobility sliding away from you if I'm sitting on my butt and I can protect my face and use my leg, my one leg that I'm not posted on to kick you. And then I could swing through and get up in an athletic manner that enables me to still protect myself and run or be offensive if i want to you know what i mean so that's generally what a base is just like we teach people how to shoot right we tell them you know legs shoulder width apart generally staggered like like a 45 degree athletic stance is what a lot of people use or a fighter stance because you're ready to fight it's interesting how many folks i think part of it is learned and part of it is maybe just their makeup don't really have good awareness of their body you know we'll we'll tell people in a class setting like you know show me a good athletic stance and the dude looks like you're looking at him like what are you what are you doing you know like all right get aggressive and you look and you're like what like and it's just foreign to them i just had a uh uh gentleman come out and aaron cooper our our buddy uh, yeah. combatives instructor was out and we were just trying to teach the guy some like basic uh basic body posture like you're talking about just to be able to move from position to position just to, very simple stuff he's 70 ish years old spent his whole life in academia um very uh, uh self-aware guy but he had just never s- subjected his body to any of those things and it was like it was like watching uh, somebody that's never danced try to waltz or something. Right. Like it just look, look, just looks super goofy. So how does a guy start to overcome that? Like if they just are not – some people have the ability that they feel their body, that proprioception, some right. don't. How, what is the thought on that? Well, one thing to uh, precede that, I would say – I call, I get a lot of people say, I'm not a sports guy. You know, I've never been. I'm kind of a, you know, a reader. I'm like, well – that's fine if you're not a sports guy. I don't think, you know, the, the subculture and the sensationalism that goes along that are tied to sports nowadays in our society is is what they're talking about sometimes. You don't have to be about that to be athletic, right? I do think that if you have some kind of sports background, it teaches you certain things like in basketball or football or a lot of different sports, you're doing several tasks at one time. Like your body is always adjusting and moving into position in order to do the task that you're really trying to do, the end state that you want, which is shoot the ball or get past the guy or 
protect the ball as you power forward or ping pong even. I have to get my body out to the side to get that swing that I want, to get the angle that I want the ball to go on, right? Like it's, They're always positioning themselves and making sure they're stable to be able to affect that task, right? And what sports does or any kind of task that's similar to that, it helps you get used to doing those subconscious movements with your body staying based, like we were saying before, or getting in a good athletic platform or position in order to uh, affect what you're trying to do, right? It's all one motion, but it, it really is a lot going on. And that's where the guys that haven't experienced that much, whether it be lack of playing sports or just anything like that, where they just, they are, they're only doing one singular task while sitting static, maybe playing an instrument or whatever. They're not thinking about what their body is doing. Did you just, did you just say that like, like the people in high school band, did you just compare them? Did you just go from like the athletic jock to the band member? I'm just well, I just said, well, I was just thinking, you know, just kidding, a person that, well, <laughs> just it's a very hard task to play an instrument, but usually you see them, they're sitting unless they're in a marching band. I just, I'm just wanted right. to make a joke. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I got you. Wah, wah, wah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's, but yeah, you see I what I'm saying? We kind of have that built into us already. People that's been exposed to that, not because we're some superhuman. It's just because we practice that where right. your body is moving in order to set you up for success for the actual end state position or movement that you're trying to affect, whether right. you're shooting the ball, hitting the ball, whatever, you're adjusting your body to, to help you with that. Mm -hmm. And that's where the people that don't have those athletic stances, they probably never experienced that much, or they get caught up thinking so much about these, th these new uh, processes that you're giving them, maybe shooting a gun or throwing a punch, that they don't even think about that stuff. They're just like, I'm just trying to keep my hand to my face and then bring it straight out and turn, right, and line my shoulder and elbow up with my my, my fist. And then, so they, they really can't take in all that information at once, and you have to give it to them in, in pieces. So what I do to help guys like that is just give them menial tasks that involves them changing their body position while their hands are doing some other task, right? Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. you know. And that could be anything. That could be putting you on an agility ladder where you're doing some kind of something with your feet or just switching step back and forth where you're keeping your feet more than shoulder width apart, but also just keeping your hands like touching your head every time or, or holding the gun and extending and seeing the sights as you're doing it. You know what I mean? Something like that. Yeah. J just to give them some exposure to doing two things at once or multiple things at once and your body's remaining balanced as you do it. Mm -hmm. I have found that a good boxing coach – that I found it's a fact. Any good boxing coach always starts a new boxer out with footwork, right? You're not right. like, here's the heavy bag, go to town. They right. don't, you don't start with that. They start by teaching you how to move. And it's all simple, right? Everything you're saying, pivoting on your foot, balls of your feet, not because you want to be on the balls of your feet to be on your balls of your feet, but it helps you to be able to move quickly. Right. If you're not flat footed. And People ask that all the time. Well, why do I got to stand on my toes? You're not on your toes. You're in a position just like you'd be if you were playing catch with your buddies. You're ready to move, ready to move. You know, right. playing frisbee. If you just watch kids playing, they're in a always in a state of motion, and you're not flat-footed and in feet together. Kids or anybody is in that position where they're able to pivot yeah. and move and take off. That that I think it for a lot of people that seek this information out, it comes down to that goofy factor too. I don't want to look dumb. I, before we uh, redid the floors here, we had taped uh, boxes on the floor and, um, uh, you know, the V working on kicks and such. We had all different kinds of marks on the floor just for that, that we would use with the guys to help them figure out. I didn't have an, uh, I didn't have an agility ladder, but, uh, uh, now I use string, so I don't have to mark the floor up. Right. And it looks so stupid. You know, why am I doing this? Because, man, you, your feet aren't programmed to move yet. And that, I think, is like when you start teaching guys, to, now you're back to your point of let me show you this technique on how to choke a guy or whatever. It doesn't mean shit when that guy knows how to get your legs out from underneath you right. or move you off balance or move you at all. I remember the first time that, that I wrestled with a guy that was a good wrestler. He wasn't like, you know, division one or something, but he went to college on a scholarship. I was 17 
And he was maybe 30 at the time, very compact, like 5'7", 160 pounds, quintessential wrestler. And we went out in the grass behind a house, and it was probably three seconds, and I was on my back, and three seconds, and I was slammed face into the dirt in three seconds. And it was like so stupid, like, all right, let me do this again. And he just kept pushing me off balance and it wasn't even hard for him. He'd sweep a leg, double leg, single leg. And, and I started to watch like a, when he grabs me, if I splay my feet back out, I can at least stop him from getting them. But then he and knew he had a counter. Get, yeah. And then he'd get up on top of me and drive me face first into the ground. <laughs> but that he started as like a five-year-old going to, uh, you know, local, local wrestling gym and then went through grade school and high school and stuff. And so that's all natural to him. Yeah. Yeah. It was the, the amount I tell folks all the time and I'm not a re, like a wrestling guy. Um, but anybody I've ever come across that grew up wrestling, man, they're like the most athletic people as far as like the way that their body moves. And you watch like in a jujitsu gym, a guy that's like a good high school wrestler shows up. He's automatically light years ahead of even a football yeah. player or somebody yeah, else. They'll, they'll be missing like the, the submission aspect, but usually they're never in a bad position. Right. It's hard to get them in a bad position. Yeah. And if you do, it's getting on their back because they never go to their back. They'll give they'll turn to their belly first, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. And then you're like, oh. <laughs> yeah. uh, but and I tell people like, sorry, I hit my computer, but right. I, I, people would message me and they ask me these same questions and I've, and I've said different shit all the time. Like, Hey man, uh, you know, a gym up near me, or, uh, you know, a guy that you recommend that teaches jujitsu that don't cost too much. And I'm like, what I tell a lot of people, and this is for everybody out there, back to my point of where you kind of start. If you have no training, you don't have the money, suck up your ego, throw it in a bag, go to the wrestling gym, unless you're like some kind of child predator, go to the, <laughs> go to the high school. I was lucky one time, like even after I got into it, but I realized how welcoming they are. My, one of my, my oldest daughter's boyfriend, when she was in high school, he wrestled for one of the high schools and I would go to wrestling practice with him. And he had, they had big guys, guys there that, you know, they're not as, as big as me, but they're big. They have guys at 200 and you know, 50 pounds in high school nowadays, and they got big man wrestling. They do different type of wrestling because usually most of them can't shoot on their knees real quick and they can't change levels real fast. So they got what they call big man wrestling, more upper body stuff or single legs, snatch single legs. And you and I would go wrestle with them, just work drills with them just to help benefit me and help benefit them, give them a little taste of man strength, I guess. Man strength. But if I didn't have any money and I didn't have any skill, if you go to a – a high school wrestling workout and you get in good with the coach and he says, Hey, I don't want you hurting my, my wrestlers obviously or whatever, but you can come in and do this. That would be a great place to start because wrestling for one, maybe you won't win a jujitsu tournament. Maybe you won't win a boxing match, but you will always have good position and you'll learn not to roll over on your hip, not to be on your back. And I'd also tell people that coming into the gym, I ask people just like you and I say a lot, like, what is your goal? What is your, the end state that you desire? Do you just want to be capable? If they're coming in for self-defense purposes, there's nothing better than never being out of position. Like, I know how to get your hips and put you on your back, and I know how to keep you from ever getting my hips and putting me on my back. As long as the person that's in front of you doesn't have better right, right. <laughs> grappling skills. <laughs> Which, you know, if you, as long as you're not in a, some competition where the elite-level people come together or you're, the, you're in the – typical population most yeah. people aren't going to have that and most of them that that have it are not going to be picking fights with you unless you're picking fights with them then you're the asshole and you know you it's deserve it that's a good point but so if you can maintain good position if i could be on top if i can never find myself uh in an awkward position where i can't be offensive or run and i still have the ability to get to my tools get behind something run away whatever that's where I want to be, maintaining that good position, those good mm -hmm. that good base at all times. All right. So go to the go to the high school wrestling gym or with a high school wrestling coach. And if they'll let you, even just observe, just watch what they're doing. I mean, they're gonna do things that are foreign to us because there's rules part of the wrestling, how they start and the referee position and all that different stuff. But starting standing up, you'll see 
and they they kind of got an agreement amongst each other so they come in like this and they collar tie and do all this different stuff but all the principles apply you'll never see them be on their back for long they're turning over and getting to their knees at least where they can build back up quickly right you're not going to get them down for long not any wrestler right they have instincts building like no you're not getting my hips you're not getting control of me you're not getting my legs you're not going to push me around. They turn the corner quick. You, you try to pull, get past them, look, you can go to their back. They turn with you and they keep you in front of them. Right? So it's, there's a lot of good stuff that comes from that. And it's, and it's all you got sometimes. If that's all you got and you, and you have access to it, go do the wrestling, man. You don't have to put on a singlet. You don't have to put on a little thing, a skimpy thing showing your Peter. You know? <laughs> that's why I didn't do it in high school. I was like, I don't want people to see my Peter in my singlet. Because they don't wear cups, most of them, you know? That's why God made socks. Well, I used to tell uh, Jose, was my daughter's boyfriend at the time, I used to tell him, I was like, man, why don't you put a cuff on, bro? Like, yeah, everybody sees your, your skinny little peck. <laughs> I was like, you're not leaving nothing to the imagination. <laughs> That's funny. I was like, I'm not worried about you with my daughter, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> so, tough question. Just like any skill, so we've got the criteria. Somebody that doesn't have this experience in the fighting arts wants to learn to be able to keep a base, keep somebody from taking their legs out from underneath them. The person has average intelligence and has uh, health has something to do with it. If you're busted up all the time, you're not going to be able to train. But we'll just assume the person has pretty good physical health and conditioning and can train. How much time should they be training? Once a week for six months, will they be skilled enough to do this? Once a week for uh, a year, every day for a month? Like how much time do, does somebody have to commit to really develop that? And it's a, that's a, a, a deeply uh, dependent question, but on average. I think, well, you know, there's science to, to building uh, – muscle memory right they talk about what ten thousand reps or so of something and that's just one thing i think that full immersion in something and i'm not trying to plug the fight camp thing but the way i did it is the week is that we do it it's a full eight hour day like you're going to be there because i want to immerse you in what we're doing and we're going to hammer down on the principles that i'm pushing right uh and i want them to do it because i feel like eight hours straight immersion for four months, four different sessions, which is basically four total days, will get you a base that you just have to maintain. Now, once you have a base saying that, and and I don't know what that number would be, maybe a good week or two of full commit, committal to whatever that craft is, immersing yourself in it, that would get you ahead of the power curve, that get you to catch up a little bit. You'd be exposed to it if you're doing the right things. Mm-hmm. Um, so it needs to be some long period of time to develop that foundation Mm -hmm. something Mm -hmm. that just immerses you in that all day that's all you're thinking about that day there's no i'm halfway thinking about this because i came to an hour class so i'm halfway invested and then i'm halfway and then about the middle of the class maybe i'm fully invested and then 30 minutes before the class is over i'm already thinking about what i need to do next you know that's Mm -hmm. not Mm -hmm. that might be good for maintenance but that's not good for developing that foundation you follow me Mm -hmm. you need some full immersion so i would say anything that a good number off the top of my head that I shoot for is a good four total days committed, like full eight hour days, right? Okay. With those guys doing those drills. And then after that, I would say twice a week, maybe for an hour, two hours. Once you've got some kind of level under your belt, uh, uh, some kind of, you know, you, you understand the base principle, you understand leverage, you understand putting your weight on somebody and, and learning how to be heavy, Instead mm-hmm. of bearing your own weight, making the, your opponent or somebody else bear your weight, stuff like that, then you can start adding little tricks and tips to it, little techniques here and there. The jujitsu part becomes easier. You learn, like, I'm on my back. Oh, I can lean up on my hip and turn this way. If I'm not flat on my back, I'm stronger, so I turn on my shoulder, things like that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that's just a couple times a week, you know, minimal. Which is cool, man. If it, same thing with, with guns, playing the guitar. It's It doesn't take – a huge investment of time. Now, if the person wants to win like the Pan Am games or uh, make it to the UFC, yeah, you're not doing that on two hours a week, but that's right, right. not the goal here. 
we want to be able to yeah they're, they're training you know six hours a day every right. day maybe one day off you know for people that want to do that specialty at that high level and another thing is and the reason i say you need that immersion like everything that i've got there's my, all my skills are perishable i'm not as good as at a lot of things that i was once good at probably right um but the shooting schools that i've been to like we've been lucky because it's been free for me because it was on the army's dime the ammo was provided by them and it was mm -hmm. regimented where I had to do, I had to be at a certain level, maybe not the highest level, maybe not whatever. They're not teaching, you know, the best three gunners in the world to be the best three gunners, but they really hammer down on the fundamentals and getting your reps in there and learning about that gun. And it's been like two weeks at a time every day for 10 hours, maybe. We dry fire after the live fire. And that's not the only time that I went and done, you know, marksmanship or, or firearms training. You know, there's several classes or, or, or schools that way where it just immerses you and you're just you're just beat up by it. Sometimes it has diminishing returns, but still, like the the good thing about being immersed and being pushed into something that's regimented like that is even when your mind is not willing, you're you still have to keep up with the safety fundamentals or safety rules at all times, and you're still doing that. So I'm still getting reps, even if I'm not learning anything new at that time. I'm just reinforcing those reps. I'm like, man, I'm, I don't feel like. They're talking about shooting five round strings at three times. I don't give a shit about this drill, but you're still practicing all of the good fundamentals that mm -hmm. are involved mm -hmm. with, with that craft, right? So I really believe that you need to just immerse yourself. Go immerse yourself. Be embarrassed for a good amount of time. Like, hey, I'm going to go be unathletic and goofy around the people that may be more athletic or more coordinated or stronger than me for a good half a week's time. I'm going to be committed to it. And... Then let's see what I got on the, at the end. You know, you lick your wounds, um, take some motion, figure out where you're going to go from there. And once you got a base, but you, it's going to really open your eyes. It's going to really open your eyes, and uh, that's what people need, I think. And and back to our point of learning other skills besides just firearms, the composure thing. You know, Mick, I'm always pre preaching composure, and one thing I, I've been saying a lot lately is. I always figure out new things, ways to say things in my head. I'm like, uh, skills don't mean shit if you can't apply those skills when it counts, right? Yeah. You can have all the skills in the world, but when it comes time to really use them for what they're meant for and you can't do that, it, what the is those skills? What are they worth? They're worth followers maybe. I don't know, on, on social media, but that's it. Um, are they worth entertainment value? But other than that... Nice. Nice. Awesome, man. Added that to some curricula. I'm honored, man. For real. Uh, but there's not much more composure that you're going to gain. And uh, I've argued with Doc Hun, Doc Seth Hassel Hun. Uh, he, he, we talked about him before. The, the, I just uh, was commenting on one of his posts this morning. Yeah. Yeah. Performance. He's a doctor, performance psychologist type role at Fifth Group. Helps with a lot of the uh, the curriculum development for their their shooting school there at Fifth Group at Fort Campbell. He's a great great asset. Uh, sometimes I don't think they realize what they've got. Great guy, and he's also gotten involved in shooting himself and stuff just by way of being exposed to it so much. But I, I've argued with him. I was trying to get him to give me some you know scientific uh, way to explain how fighting in general gives you composure to be better at other things. And he's like, man, I don't think they relate. Well, I'm, I'm still working on it. I'm still trying to figure out this theory that I've got working. Does he relate or does he just didn't? Well, he's saying that I was trying to say it makes you better at life all around <laughs> if you, as a man if you just feel confident enough to handle yourself. I agree with you. I mean, that's kind of the premise of the Kerry Trainer program. Use this craft to gain confidence. He didn't agree? <laughs> well, maybe I just wasn't presenting it to him uh, eloquently enough because I'm not the most eloquent guy, but he – he was maybe he thought I was saying something else, but I was trying to say like, man, I, I think it just makes you uh, as a as a man anyway. It just makes you more confident all around. Like I'm less likely to start that. I'm less likely to try to prove myself, which puts me in a in dumbass positions, you know, mm -hmm. like it did when we was talking high school, and just all around, I'm more at peace with myself because I feel like I've a sense of accomplishment. Like I've I've got something. I've got something here, and and I, I, I would build off of that. So it's just an inner peace with my ego 
that is constantly plaguing men in general, I think. Our egos plague us and tell us to do stupid shit. And uh, I think that kind of calms you down and lets you kind of know, hey, man, I am. It kind of gives yourself validation to a certain yeah. degree that kind of stays home with you, if for lack of a better way of putting it. It kind of stays there instead of just trying to seek the next thing. Yeah. All right. And by no means does it eliminate my ego because I still have it, you know, and I, still, I just try to put it in check. But uh, I, I was, what I was thinking about with composure is somebody's got you on the ground, you're completely exhausted, and your pride and your, your resolve is telling you don't quit, don't give up because they're really not hurting you. But they put you in a position where you're kind of freaking out, where they're smothering you a little bit. Maybe you're, you're sweating so bad and their chest is against your face and you're like... <sighs> like you're breathing out of a straw and you're tired as hell and something in your mind because of you exposing yourself to this situation over and over tells you don't quit just keep just settle down think about what you can do right now what's your what's your opportunity here what what technique do i need where do i need to put my hand where do i need to turn my head oh bump my hips a little bit to get a little space you know that kind of composure in that type of situation it's hard to duplicate anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Where are you being smothered out of breath where another man's controlling you and you have to just come to your senses and be like, don't freak out. Camping with me. Yeah, right. Usually you drug us up though, so I'm kind of <laughs> indifferent. Eat the marshmallows. <laughs> just eat them. <laughs> They're good. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, where do you... Yeah, you duplicate that other yeah, than business business that. world doesn't do that. Academia doesn't do that. It's and that's like one of the things that sports do that some, but it's not the same. Playing football and stuff, yeah, it's it, you've got some of that th those dynamics there, but it's not the same as what you're talking right. about. It's definitely, and if I take that, maybe I need somebody to connect the pieces for me and present it to me well, but why couldn't you take that same resolve and composure involved in that and say, I got this deadline tomorrow, stress is on, blah, 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 and be like, yeah. look, hey, what's important now? What what do I need to do? Is freaking out helping me? No, it's not. Just like when Mickey was smothering me with my own shirt, it wasn't helping me to freak the out. I just need to bear with it, see what I can do. I'm not dead yet. I'm not incapacitated. Let's keep moving. That applies to many things. That mindset applies. I feel like it does. And, you know, maybe it's hard to get people to, to piece together the two, but I think you're naturally stronger. You, back to wrestlers, I respect wrestlers very much because not only – a lot of times they, they get – we call them 100 percenters in the gym. Some of them just go crazy because they cause all they're taught in wrestling is because you, you can't stall in wrestling. They, they're – the rules rule set makes you push forward. So their whole mindset is hustle forward, forward, forward. And it gets them in trouble sometimes in the jiu-jitsu realm because they'll push their neck into something or, you know, they'll put themselves in a bad position that they didn't realize was a bad position. Uh, but their resolve and their lack of quit for most of the guys that I see that have got a wrestling background is amazing to me. And I think that's what a man needs, right? Uh, he can push through. They know how to cut, cut weights. Cut, cutting weight sucks. So if you can fight through that, it's like being in the desert with a horse with no name. <laughs> but it's not as pleasant as that song. And uh, being strong, working out the, the, the practices they do where they just continually work, 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 it sucks. They've already, they've already, they're refining their steel and their mm -hmm. metal to the point that there's not many things going to break them mentally. They're going to push through. They're strong. I've seen this uh, uh, Dan Gable. You heard of Dan Gable? Oh, yeah. Gable Grip. Yeah, it's about um, he watches one of, the, one of the documentaries about him. It shows like live footage when he was coaching at Iowa. And uh, he had his wrestlers, and I think he had a couple All-Americans at that time. They're in the basketball gymnasium. And, you know, the basketball gymnasium has the stairs all the way up. It's like a big bowl, right? He has them. He keeps telling me because he's always made his guys the mindset for the Iowa wrestlers like if they got pushed off the mat, they ran back to the middle of the circle. No matter if it's the last period or not, they're exhausted. They run back to the middle, wait for the referee to tell them to go, and they beat the opponent back every time. And the opponent's like, "Why the f is this guy still running?" Right? You no, know, they're 
dragging ass over there. But that was his mindset. And he had those guys working out. They're running up and down those stairs, which is however many stories high, up and down, up and down. And when they get to the top, he's having them pummel each other, like that video I just posted where the guys are pummeling. Mm -hmm. And they're crying. They got tears in their eyes because they are just so, so exhausted. But they're just going. <sighs> and that that kind of resolve how can you not respect that as a man like yeah man he it's won't cool. quit he will not quit and and coach gable was like keep going keep going and they weren't doing anything hard they were doing it at a level that they could maintain but they were just dead tired and i just remember that seeing that kid crying and he's just still pushing still pushing that's the mindset we gotta have and if you're never exposed to that what's gonna happen when you're faced with the hardest thing in your life which may be seeing your own blood, maybe out of breath as somebody's just punching you in the face. Is that the hardest thing you're going to see? Well, we can duplicate that to some extent, or we can at least cultivate the mindset of never quitting, right? And it don't just happen out of anywhere. You just don't tell yourself, I'm tough and I'll never quit. Go ahead and get outside. Go do a CrossFit workout to where you're wanting to gag and see if you don't want to quit. Mm -hmm. See if you don't want to quit. I guarantee you Fatigue makes cowards of all men. You and me both. We're, I'm a coward. If you get me tired enough, I'm a coward. I'll quit on you. But I need an extra gear. Mm -hmm. Where am I going to develop that extra gear? Where am I going to develop it? Unless I'm put in a situation where I need to push forward. Now, that mindset can get you in trouble sometimes. You know, we used it in the military. It can get you injured. You have to be intelligent nowadays, obviously, of a, a man that has to work, a man that has an everyday job, mm -hmm. has to be there for his kids and wife. You don't want to be injured. I don't want to have that mindset all the time, but you can test your mettle every now and then, you know, put yourself in that situation in a safe environment. And that's why, you know, I constantly try to refine and look for other ways to, to drill for the average guy, the everyday person or average girl to be able to do these types of things and put themselves in those situations without injuring themselves, without breaking a leg or whatever. Yeah. But there are some risks to it. You just got to do it in an intelligent way. And uh, that's what I'm dedicated to finding the best way to get from point A to point B and help you develop that mindset, capability and composure that's required for that situation. I'll shut up. Man. No, you're not. It's good. I was just going to say, so like the wrap up here and, from the basis of the conversation, which the funny thing is people have discussions like you and I never do. Uh, what's the best gun or what's the best technique or what's the best martial art, et cetera. And those types of discussions are really not something one can discuss. They have to go practice the craft and find out if it works for them. So really the moral of this is the gun is applicable for a certain skill set. the physical stuff, regardless of your age or limitations, you still have something that you can learn to better yourself. I, uh, my friend Dave, when he comes over here to box, I was telling you this the other day, sometimes I just start laughing because it's like, I got nothing. You know, he's 10 times the boxer I am. I got nothing. Like I'm just, I can, I cover up and I'll just start laughing, not because it's funny, but like my brain's just like overloaded and I just feel shit hitting me. <laughs> and, and it's just, you know, just like, I, I got nothing, you know, like if we were in the street, I would probably blast him in the gut with a right foot, you know, I'd get him, get him away from me. I can't do that when we're, and sometimes I'll check his leg with my, with my foot. I'll, you know, just to let him know, like if I wanted to, I could, but that's not the rules. And so my limitations are easily, or I'll go to the gym here with my friend, Dan, who's a brown belt like you. And it's like, I'm stronger than him. I'm. I don't know if I'm as fit as him. He's pretty conditioned. He beats me. He beats me. And that, that's acceptable. He's got 15 years of solid training every single day. But, like, in that, I learn, okay, like, don't – by not going and being embarrassed, I'm not getting any better. So, like, the people listening, if you truly have the goal – which is what it all comes back to. You said it, I said it, of living a long, full life, of not getting killed in violence, of not being uh, uh, a derelict father or parent because you don't have the ability to protect your family, then you have to expose yourself to this stuff. You have to. And, and it's, 
to your point about the father or husband or, or mother even, yeah, single mother, like, or a married if got, mom. If you got kids or you got somebody that depends on you daily, when they look at you, whether it be about math questions on homework or we just got in a wreck, they look to you for answers. They're going to look at you for answers. They don't know that you don't know everything. They know that you are the source for for answers for them. Yeah. They assume that you must know something about something. If it comes down to violence or robbery or somebody trying to physically hurt you or them, they're going to look at you for answers. Have some kind of answer. Right. Have that, some kind of answer. They're going to look at you. Have something for them. Justify uh, their mind or the, their their perspective of you, that you are their source of information. Like give them something. So it, it's our duty. It's our responsibility to have some kind of answers. I can't just not, mm -hmm. I can't know everything. Bottom line. But I need to find out what's the worst case scenarios. I need to be able to deal with those to a, an acceptable level. I have an acceptable capability in those situations. You know, a big wreck. I'm bleeding to death. You need to have some of those emergency capabilities. And then the most likely scenarios, you need to have, obviously, acceptable capability there as well. All right? So they're going to look at you. Maybe that shit never happens, but Lord have mercy if it does happen. Mm -hmm. And you don't have the answer and you freeze up. All right? It's our responsibility. I got a phone call the other day, Thanksgiving evening. Uh Wife and sister are sitting in front of the fireplace. We had a big meal and everybody's tired. And it was probably, I don't remember what time it was, but it was late and I was ready for bed and my phone rang. And it was a friend of mine who I haven't seen in well over a year. He lives in Alabama. And I thought maybe he just butt dialed me because of the time and the holiday. But I grabbed it and I'm, I answered. I'm like, hey, man, what's up? And I hear, <laughs> and I thought he must have dialed me, you know, jogging or something. And he yeah, goes, Mick, jogging. he goes, Mick, it's, and I'm like, Hey dude, what's up? He says, uh, I'm in the mall and there's somebody shooting. This was that shooting that happened in Alabama uh, on, yeah. on Thanksgiving evening. And I'm like, what? And I, you can hear melee screaming footsteps, just a lot of noise in the background. I'm like, are you joking? I didn't have the news on. I didn't hear about it. Yeah. And He's like, no, man. He's like, I don't know what to do. And I'm like, well, where are you? What's around you? And he, I go, are you alone? You know, I'm asking him like four questions real quick. Who's with you? Where are you at? What do you see? Are people shooting at you? Do you have something to hide behind? And he's with seven women, family, like mom, girlfriend, sister, aunt. I'm like, dude, you got to boogie the f out of there. Wherever there's not a lot of people and it's away from the bullets, start going that way. So he's like, all right. So he's moving with his family and eventually he gets him outside and he's like, I can't get to my truck, man. There's like people everywhere. I said, just go to the road, get away, call Uber right now before everybody else gets on the phone with Uber, get a car, go home, get your truck the next day. You can hear gunfire in the background as this is happening. So he calls me later. I said, call me when you're home safe. You know? So he calls me. He's like, all right, we got a car. We got out of there. And he's like, you know, thanks for talking. And I said, dude, you know, I appreciate that you called me. I said, it's like, that's a perfect example. You had never, I'm guessing you've never thought about what would happen. And that mall, I've never been there. Apparently it was a big mall, but there's a couple clips up. I think on ABC News on Instagram, there's a clip of all the people running um, as that stuff was happening, but he'd never thought, what would I do? Or if he did, he didn't think about it enough to actually like have that come to the surface when he needed it. And so he did what he he did something else. He called somebody that he thought could at least help him. And I had no real uh, value to add other than like, calm down, look around you and pay attention. But that's the problem when you d don't or, or have not exposed yourself right. uh, mentally or physically. He can shoot, but it was like, uh, uh, and the wheels get mucked up, the mud gets on the gears, and you just don't know what to do. Well, that's so, back to your point of, like, what is your end goal for what you're shooting is for? Like, yeah. all right, now you've got the technique down, the process of the mechanics of getting the bullet to hit, hit where you want, but is that the context of why we learn to shoot? Right. No, that's just the, that's just the, the foundational part. 
Right. So you can actually use the gun, but now you need to use it in the context. Right. And make decisions about it. Right. right? When would I be shooting? If it's for competition, then I guess you train in that, right? But you have to know what's going on around you. You have to be in those scenarios, that force on force type shit or whatever complex scenarios that's hard to do hard to do on a flat range. Flat range only gets you so far. And we talked about this as well. Flat range can only get you so far with your own imagination testing you. Right? Because even if your own imagination, you're telling yourself, I'm gonna turn and I'm gonna do something that's gonna surprise me and then I'm gonna act different in this scenario. You're still kind of setting the conditions. <laughs> still, you're yeah. still setting the conditions. You know what I mean? You're not yeah. That's not you're a not true reacting. Test. You're not reacting to something that's real. It's contrived. Yeah, it's not a true test. And yeah. uh, you can only get so far. So if you're gonna shoot with guns, get good at the mechanics, acceptably good. You don't have to be a grandmaster before you start doing scenarios yeah. and fighting. Fighting with a gun. Right. That what's your reason? What's your reason? If you have the skills and you can't apply them when it counts, call Mick on the phone. I was, I was, uh, uh, it, he and I are going to do a podcast on that. He's willing to discuss what happened to him mentally through that scenario. And it's, I mean, I've had that happen, not in that situation, but about other things where I just couldn't, you know, what uh, 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 I can't, can't get to the next spot. You get locked up. So it just said, as you were just talking that popped in my head, there's so much that goes into all of this, but I think, I think sometimes, like if you look around behind me, I was, before we started this, there's so much stuff in here. Each thing's got a purpose, but in reality, none of this crap, there's 10 rifles on that wall, shotguns there, guns in that safe, all the crap you see behind me. I've got one little gun in my pocket, a pocket knife and a little flashlight with me. You know, that's it. That's what I have. The, the, the loading presses, the, you know, sights, magazines, dummy rounds, training pistols. Uh, there's optics over there. There's uh, more flashlights, just more stuff. All of it serves a purpose. And we get like, it's not, I'm not, I'm not talking about stuff right now, but the idea that all of this stuff in some way, shape or form supports my broad goal, but really you don't need all of it. It's not, um, it doesn't all support the goal. It supports a different goal, which is I enjoy the stuff. It's fun. It's shooting. It's whatever. But the real goal of being able to protect and defend innocent life is something entirely different than all this shit. Yeah. Yeah. And so my brain wouldn't get locked up in that scenario because I invest a bunch of thought in that. You, you and I, the first time we were uh, together in uh, Clarksville, were sitting in a, I've told this story before, we were sitting in a coffee shop and we were just scenario based talking about somebody runs in the door and uh, starts shooting the place up. And it was like, all right, your family's with you. And you're like, well, I'd leave with my family. And I'd make sure if I had to, I'd send bullets at the bad guy as I was pushing my family out the door. Like, that's really, really simple. You don't really need to make it complicated. Bad guy's there. Safety's there. We're going that way. And I'm shooting bullets at him as we're going that way. And that was just a for example of the, the thing that we discussed. I think people, just like they don't go to the gym to look foolish or get embarrassed, they don't think about this stuff because it seems more complicated or can be more complicated than it need be. Right. When it might that's just why be... I you and I, I think I think we do a lot of principle based stuff like I know there's plenty of techniques out there that you can use and I don't think there's hardly anything that I subscribe to that I think is the absolute only way to do right I, yeah as far as technique goes I think there are principles that you must have and when you and I teach things uh, that's kind of what we, we hit on like well you got to have this right you got to have this amount of capability here or you got to the pistol's got to be pointed in the direction that it needs to be, you know, it's things like that. But as far as the holsters and all the different stuff, as long as it meets the goal and it's safe and, you know, it's, it's good for uh, the purposes that you intend it for, it's good, however you want to do it, right? And we talk about that type of stuff. You don't have to have much of a plan. If you have some capability that you've, you've mm -hmm. tested yourself, you've been challenged, 
it's going to give you an overall confidence because I, I don't think so hard about things. Like the more that I have prepared, it's like the less that my anxiety bothers me when it comes to stressing about certain situations. It's not a an overconfidence. I think it's just that I know that to some degree I will act in the when there's a need for action. But other than that, my plan is, and like you're talking about in the restaurant, like can I survive right here from the initial threat, whatever it might be, whatever the likely uh, avenue of approach or whatever it would be? Can I survive here? Can I get my family down? That's it. Now, if they're close to me, I got to attack them. If they're far away, I just need to survive, and that'll give me a minute to think. There's how I get out. I know where that is, whatever. And that's it. Like, mm -hmm. if you're thinking about, I'm going to pull my gun out, and I'm going to take two shots over there, like, you're thinking too much into it. Your training should kind of take over when it comes to that point. Just know how to survive. Know that you can be in a spot to survive. Maybe is this cover that I'm near, or is it not cover? I mm -hmm. prefer to be near some of the cover. I don't need to have my back to the wall. I don't need to be in the eagle's nest of the restaurant. I just need to be able to survive. And that's that's what I think about. And that's real general, wouldn't you say? I think it's the same. I like to use the analogy of when I'm driving on the highway, which I do more than many people. I'm not like 10 and 2 glued to the road. I can be relaxed while I'm driving. I can talk on the phone. I can even sometimes put my phone on the phone holder and record a live feed. I can listen to the radio. I can talk to my passenger, but I also see where the other cars are. I see where the exit is because I got to get gas or a cup of coffee. I can check the GPS or, or map or compass as I'm doing that. And the same thing, like you're saying, I don't, I, that's funny. I'll go to, I was with uh, some students recently and they, we went to get drinks and dinner after class. And they're like, you can take the, the best spot, the one in the corner with your back to, and I'm like, I'm good, man. I'll sit right here. Cause all you are the ones that are tweaking out. <laughs> so I'll see your eyes get big. As, so I says, you know, I'll see the bad guy in the reflection of your pupil, like a movie, but, uh, it just, yeah, like walking through the mall, just, it, it becomes so subconscious that, sometimes my wife will be like, what are you looking at? And, and I don't even, I'll have to say, Oh, I just noticed that that was the like office or the hallway that goes to the offices at the mall where I'm sure there's an exit through there. And I didn't even think about it. I'm just like, Oh, okay, there we go. Like that's there or whatever. Somebody walks in, you glance at them. We go to the movies all the time. I think I've told you this. Like I have my favorite spot at the movie theater we go to that gives me the most amount of time to see the person coming in. And I only do that at the movie theater because it's dark and it's shitty in the movie theater, unlike a restaurant, but I can see the most amount of longer. It takes a person coming around the corner two seconds. Well, I get two seconds to see a rifle barrel or something. And when somebody comes in the movie theater, when I'm watching, I just go, okay, kid with popcorn. Okay. Mom going to the bathroom, whatever. And it's just subconscious and it doesn't, disturb me i'm not disturbed driving i'm not disturbed or paranoid walking through the mall or yeah. in the theater well there's a lot of that too as i'd say because you know you're prepared with the uh with a plan to affect violence to some degree in any scenario yeah right? because you do subject yourself to uh training with aaron and training with the other guys and going to shoot and and thinking through these things when you're when you're training like some of that is you know that you're going to be able to rely on the, the preparation and the work that you've already put in. And then the other part is there's just a simple way to do it. Like there's not, you choose not to let life and anxiety be a hindrance mm -hmm. because you have to be out in public and you can't be worrying about every ninja in the corner. Exactly. So the simple skills, I think your point to Doc Hun, he just didn't get it. I think it's very true. I, I become or have become the older I get more comfortable, competent. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's, it's, I, I have more belief in self to accomplish things because of the fighting arts and things of that nature. Like something as simple as drawing a pistol and shooting a note card four times in less than two seconds is like, Hey, that's a pretty cool physical skill. There's people that can do it better and faster. But like the fact that I figured out how to do that in a week of trying, 
Like, what else can I do if I put my mind to it? What else can I do if I apply a focused, dedicated, consistent effort to a task? Like happier home life or better retirement savings or whatever. Well, yeah. one good thing like genetics and, and nature versus nurture, all that aside, in general, I believe that anything that you've seen a human being do, whether it be amazing on some kind of superhuman planet, social media site or whatever, anything that you've seen a human do, you have the potential to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's not like they were born to do that. Right. Right. And I don't care how much muscles they have. You can, you can develop that. You can put work. I don't care what they were genetically gifted with. Right. You can work to that. Maybe it'll be a different route, but you can work to that. Anything I see a human do, I know that it's possible for me. And if I remind myself that it's not an ego thing, like, uh, they're not so great because I could do that if I wanted to. It's not like I'm thinking like that. It's just, I reminded myself that that was what their desire was. That's where their passion was. They put in the effort. It didn't just happen. Mm -hmm. work towards that goal right so there's nothing out of reach if you choose so i say that to myself in order to remind myself that we're all valuable mm -hmm. we're all valuable your disposition now your your lack of athleticism or your lack of experience or uh training time all right that's just what it is you just didn't have it for whatever reason and now if you want it go get it suffer through the embarrassment or whatever may happen when you're new to something mm -hmm. because it's natural if you're new to something you're not going to be good at it that's just life no different than anybody else and try to get good at it if that's what you desire you know what i mean it's cape you're pos it's possible for you michael jordan and uh, you know i know this is a cliche shit but you know was it something like he missed he was popped in my head too when you were talking yeah. well i know he's put out some stuff there's little quotes from michael jordan talking about how many shots he missed or game winners he's missed throughout his life you still there? Yeah, I'm listening. Okay, I thought something changed in the sound. Yeah, I heard it too. It talks about like, you know, 23,000 something shots I missed, you know, in the fourth quarter. I don't know, something like that. But it's interesting what he's trying to say there. I think he's got to a level in his life, whatever is validated him. Obviously, he's a great celebrity and, what, you know, arguably the best basketball player ever. So he don't have a lot to be self-conscious about probably. But – he wants to point out, I think he truly believes in his heart. Like he wants to tell people and motivate people to, to, to not count themselves out and to keep yeah. in themselves. Yeah, yeah. That's why he's exposing himself in the negative parts. He's like, yeah, you see all this, me flying through the air, me doing this, but I missed this many shots. I did all this. You know, there's all these times I failed. All these times I failed. And, uh, and then you go back and look at some of his history. I've read up. I used to be big into basketball, and I love Michael Jordan. He talks about how he would skip school, and I don't suggest anybody skip school, but he would skip school to go shoot, shoot free throws at the basketball court by himself. Yeah, man. He got good because of that drive and passion right there. That's Maybe you can't jump as high as Michael Jordan, but could you affect uh, the, his, that game like him if you put in the work? I think you could. I think you could, maybe not the same way, flying high like him because there is some genetics involved, whatever. But Steph Curry, uh, that shoots basketball now. I'm sorry to overtake about basketball, but I do like No, you're good, man. It's so funny you brought him up because I was thinking about an analogy with him when you were talking, so keep going. No, we're connected. Well, Steph Curry, I don't know if you heard of him now. He's, you know, uh, he was MVP a couple times, and his team is, is awesome, Golden State Warriors. Well, a lot of people criticize how he shoots. Like it's not the mechanics that they you normally see with good shooters. Does the ball go you. in? Yeah, but it yeah. Lies, usually there's a certain mechanics that people teach and they and they practice in order to to be more accurate and have consistency. And he shoots like a playground trick shot, flicks it up there, and that ball goes in. He's got several records already, you know, for three pointers made at, in the fourth quarter or in a game or whatever. And he's been the MVP. And he put in work. It may not look like what everybody else has done. It may not look like the mechanics. Your practice regimen, your way of getting from point A to point B may not look like everybody else, but it is to get the desired result that you want. One, you're going to – you need to put in the work. Steph Curry might have a, uh, a unique shot, but he put in the work, I'm sure, with that unique form that's got in where he is. It doesn't just happen. 
right? And Michael Jordan failed several times, failed several times, looked stupid, didn't make it. I think uh, you read about him, he didn't make it on his uh, basketball team as a freshman when he first started, mm-hmm. and, it, and it shut him down. He was like, oh, you know, I had high There's expectations. An, an awesome book. I haven't read it in a while. I just pulled it up on Audible. I'm going to, I'm going to, I just downloaded it again. It's uh, Tim Grover, Relentless. He wrote it. Tim Grover was the guy that was Mike's trainer for years. He had a, Michael had a contract with him. You will only train me. But then he went on to train guys like uh, Dwayne uh, Bates and other dudes after Michael retired. And the, the work ethic that that dude had, you look at the, read the book, it was three times his teammates, what the, what he did away from the team too. All those guys, their training was at practice. He went to practice, but then he had hours of every day that he trained from meals to weights, to agility training, to the actual basketball itself, the, the mechanics of the shooting and stuff. And it was just beyond compare. And Tim was the same kind of guy, Tim Grover, the book's awesome. He had the same kind of work ethic. So together, those guys, Mike did it, but he he saw the value in that trainer. He didn't do it without him and had the guy on tap for all those years. They both lived in Chicago, and I think Tim Grover's still here. But it's a good book. It's called Read. And it, that's a good segue into plugging ourselves, really. Unstoppable. Uh, the book is called Relentless, From okay. Good to Great Unstoppable. Well, I'm saying, well, a good plug for us is like even a guy with a relentless work ethic like Michael Jordan, who's achieved so much, he also realized that he's human, right? He must have because he got somebody to support him, a trainer, because, and this is a plug for having a, an insulation uh, circle, people around you, not shutting everybody out like people in my line of work tend to do when they get out of the army, they get they shut everybody out. I tend to do it, but trainers, somebody that can push you because really, I mean, the greatest in the world right there, he, re- he required somebody to help push him because mm-hmm. you can only push yourself so far. Right. You need, you need some input externally. It yeah. can't all be internally. It can't be you. Mm-hmm. You are human. Even if you are, uh, a relentless beast and savage like Michael Jordan. He needed some external input. Right. And hopefully that's what you and I can help bring to these guys that we might not train hand in hand with every day, like the guy did with Michael Jordan, but we want to help push you a little bit. So for guys out there that have no experience, no training, even scared of it, maybe we want to be there for you. And then for guys out there that, maybe have a little bit and they know a little bit of this, but they don't want to push it this far or that far, or they don't want to delve into the realm of hand to hand, or maybe they don't want to actually expose themselves in a class where other people are looking. Let us help you with that, man. Let us, yeah, man. That. Let us push you a little bit. Like we're trying to preach and teach self-reliance, but also self-truth is what I think is a, as a platform that we stand on, Nick, if you agree, self is everything. Truth is everything. And it's not just your truth, but the truth that that is is manifested in your day to day. If you go to the range and you don't shoot good, the truth is that you haven't put in that work to be able to shoot good yet. If you go get handled in a situation and you get scared to death in that situation and you feel foolish because of it because you didn't know what to do it's not because you're a piece of shit it's because the truth is you haven't prepared for that situation yet how would you be expected to handle it yeah that's the truth that we want everybody to face and what i try to face daily and i know mick that you try to be honest with yourself as much as anybody so the fun thing is about that and i appreciate what you just said i hope the listeners understand that it wasn't a sales pitch more of a we all need it you and i the bulk of most of our conversations are along that line personally um the the uh analogy just popped in my head about needing help aaron will be over here aaron could kick a tree down and he'll when we're, when we're sparring and boxing together, he likes to work a lot of kicks. 
because he's got devastating kicks. So we'll grab the big pads and we'll go kicks for three minute rounds. You know how brutal that is. Three minutes of kicking, you're ready to puke, but we'll do that for like five or six rounds with like only uh, 30 to 60 second breaks. If I was by myself, I would never, I can admit it. I would never do that. I would never sit and kick the heavy bag is not, even half that much time. Cause by the time you're through two rounds, I feel my guts churning and the, the acids building up and all my muscles. And I'm like, I can't do it. My legs start to get all jelloey and he's like, come on, you know, keep going, keep going. And it, it's just from that simple task of having a friend there. That's like, all right, if he can do it, I can do it. And then you keep going. And then when you're done, you lay on the floor and try to keep the stomach bile down and you laugh and drink a bunch of water. And you're glad that you didn't puss out. But I'd never do that by myself. Yeah, I think I better go get a pot of coffee going and, you know, cook some eggs. I and take myself to that. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, it, exactly. And, it, and people will say, like, well, I don't, why would the hell would you need to kick that much if you're not a f fighter? Well, some of it has to do with just the experience of fighting through and having resolve. And you just doing that, that's also cultivating a mindset in you. Not just about kicking. You just want That's the thing I always think about. If would I quit if I felt like this? Would I quit? Would I quit? Would I quit? And at some point we would get physically gassed where there is nothing left. Well, I haven't found that yet. I have never pushed myself to that point where it's like you just fall on the ground. I've never done that. So I mean maybe I'm a puss because I haven't done it. Well then they also your buddy saying come on, let's keep going, is duplicating that guy that's attacking you that's, that he hasn't quit yet. Oh, he hasn't quit, so I'm not allowed to quit yet. Mm -hmm. I'm not allowed to quit. But you have something eliciting that response from you, that resolve, that, that metal that says, uh, I will not quit. I will yeah. not. And that's a good, good mindset to cultivate. Indeed. Anything, I think. There's a couple really great documentaries about uh, ultra marathon runners. One of them is about the race that takes place. Is it by you in Tennessee? Uh, it's a funny race where the there's no real prize. It's put on by runners. You run from station to station and you get you tear a page out of a book. So the guy that puts the uh, race on hides a book at each of these. Uh, uh, spots Nation. that you have to hit on the race so that you can prove that you were there mm. and, and you tear a page of the book out to prove that you were there. I forget what that one's called. Somebody oh, watching. It. Yeah, it's awesome. It's on Netflix. It's a long race. It's uh, uh, my, my phone's updating, so I can't look it up. Then there's another one about a gal that ran, uh, that ran a race sometime in the last few years, trying to beat a man, a man's time. She didn't do it. It's hundreds of miles she runs nonstop, not 50 miles, not 70 miles, hundreds of miles. She comes into camp, families there, coaches, they shove her full of food, they change her socks, she'll sleep for 20 minutes, and then goes back running, sleeps for an hour, and you look at her, and she's like a, a skeleton with muscles wrapped around it, and just goes. And then there's another one about... Um, a gentleman that did the the Appalachian Trail fastest time, which is what is that, fifteen hundred miles, yeah. and it's like every day the guy runs an ultra marathon, basically every day for days after days. And you're like, how is that physically possible? And I think about like I run two miles around my neighborhood, and I'm all like weepy, hundreds of miles. You know, <laughs> they got a, I don't know, it's a different it's set point. Yeah, they got a, they, they, first off, they don't require nipples. <laughs> well, I bet they're nipples. Oh, running? Yeah. <laughs> they probably the one, the one hand. gal, they show her feet. It looks like somebody took a belt sander to her feet from the friction, just raw skin everywhere. Yeah, it's brutal. Yeah, butt cheeks are probably worn bare. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's, it takes some, well, it shows you right there, like, what kind of resolve is the human mind capable of? Mm -hmm. And what did I say earlier? Anything that I see humanly possible is possible for me because a human yeah. did it. You know what I mean? We're capable of great things. Don't say I'm never going to dunk like Michael Jordan because I'm not six foot six. 
Like, but I get what you're saying. Yeah. Muggsy Bowes was, was short. Spud Webb, yeah. Those little dudes could dunk. But they weren't jumping from the top of the key, launching 30 feet. Yeah, true. true. Yeah. But they got it done, though, for sure. I think it was a good talk, man. I think, I think folks, you guys listening, if you just Google wrestling gym, jujitsu gym, judo's awesome in my area, you'll find something. Don't go out to eat for a couple months and spend the money to go to a, a dojo or a gym and, and learn something. I would, I would advise people not to invest their money. There was a guy that emailed me last year. I could get a Krav Maga level instructor certificate, which is basically like saying you're a black belt. I could teach and, and run a school under their banner if I paid $3,000 and showed up for one week of training. It's like, uh, okay. <laughs> I, I actually called him because I'm like, let me just get this straight. I, I can pay you $3,000 and I'm going to know everything I need to know to run a functioning franchise of your company. This was an Israeli IDF guy that was doing it. Like, look out for places like that. Anybody that says something that's too good to be true is probably too good to be true. Yeah, and it goes back. I bet you could teach that stuff after that one week. But actually making it function in real life. Yeah. It's two different things. Yeah. You're not going to get that in a week. No. Not a week of a, a couple of hours a week, you know what I mean? Yeah. My friend Dan and I, Hart, talked about this recently because there was a guy that was selling a black belt in jiu-jitsu within one year. And basically what it was, maybe it might have even been less than a year. You just spent like a, a massive amount of time with this guy. It was like 50 grand or something. Pay 50 Gs and you'll have a black belt. And so Dan was argument was even if you had like eight hours a day, he didn't feel that it was enough time over a long enough amount of time to really fully, like you don't get to go compete enough in those time frames. It's just too compressed. And I don't know, that might be like one of those things that's a whole rabbit hole of a conversation, but just make sure where you're going. It's people passing on sound well, knowledge. And something to think about too, like a black belt is kind of inherently becomes a teacher as well. Mm -hmm. What you're talking about becoming a, an instructor of that technique that you would just have to learn that technique within that week. So now you're not talking about having skills as far as the technique individually, but also being able to impart that knowledge. And yeah. Instructor, which is just not, it's not just something that happens. Right. You have to either have a niche for it because of your experience prior or whatever your personality is now. And then you still make uh, changes and refine that instructor part, right? Because you can't just, just cause you know something doesn't mean you can teach it as well. So you're saying you're going to get both of those skills mm -hmm. in one week. You're going to know it and you're going to be teaching it. And have the ability to articulate it and pass it on in a meaningful way. It's, 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 it's marketing and it's preying upon people that are looking for a certificate to boost their ego or to make money. But that's just, I, I just am, cautioning any of you to if you're going to invest your resources just like shooting or anything else go on yelp read reviews uh, ask send z or i a, a message through instagram or, or uh, via email and now i'm not the end all be all but i at least know that i can tell you where to go or not go or i could send you to somebody that will know it's pretty easy these days especially with all of the resources out there to not find shit and your idea of the local wrestling coach I was a deputy in our town that was a, a good wrestler, and now he runs the wrestling camp for the kids uh, going from grade school to high school every summer. Like, there's guys like that that just are happy to pass on knowledge. Yeah, Hell, maybe. you probably could start a club. Go ahead. If you can't find a way to break the ice and get to know somebody, just be a donor to their, to their cause. They always need money for freaking wrestling shoes or singlets or banners or whatever like hey hi i'm bob and i'd like to give you a donation yeah to play with that kid <laughs> <laughs> call yeah. me if you're a creep yeah, uh, you will be found out so you will be found out no creeps allowed we're just making jokes to any of you people that have a problem with these jokes i think it was a good discussion i think uh next time you and i are in person i want to film some of these things uh aaron and i have attempted to do that and it just has not worked out 
where it was something that we could really use, but it'd be great to get down and like film what we talked about, you know, here's what this looks like. Here's a way of, of doing it, you know? For sure. For sure. Yeah, we should do that. Actually, I should probably put it on my calendar to show up to all four of those classes of yours. I'd That's what that. I should do. It's that. only it's only 16 hours round trip times four. <laughs> 16, 32, 48, 64 hours of car time. Let's see what I uh, do that. I do that for you. Maybe we could get a couple of them and uh, do like on that Sunday, do a class over at Jerry's or something. Uh, I've, I make it work. I'm going to take a look. As long as I don't have a class any of those days somewhere, I'll make it work. Hey, man, I appreciate it. Parting thoughts from you. Parting thoughts. Uh, don't sell yourself short. By any means, realize that you may be the one in your inner circle that is looked upon to have the answers. And, I, and you, you very well should have a few answers. Not always perfect answers, but you need something. Mm -hmm. And uh, the gun is not the end-all, be-all. It's not the end-all, be-all. It does equalize those that have a gun. Like, I need to be able to equal the amount of force they have or trump their amount of force. Um, whether it be a gang of people that I just can't fight off or a guy with a gun or whatever the case is. But there's, there's not many things in this world that I know of that is going to give you the composure and the confidence that a uh, grappling of some sort, some kind of combative art that you subject yourself to will give you. Um, find something. Get some hand-to-hand. -hand. It's got physical uh, attributes that, that will help you out. And it's definitely going to build on your ego and help us to be more healthy with our egos, I think. So try it out, guys. I like it. Everybody, if you have not uh, checked out Z's channel on Instagram, it is Instructor Z Do. Just kidding. Just Instructor Z. He's also got some cool videos up with uh, Tactical Rifleman, his old uh, teammate, Sergeant Major, right? Yep, Sergeant Major Carl Erickson on youtube tactical rifleman i just watched one of his videos last night him and uh, your seal buddy were shooting through walls and concrete and all kinds of stuff testing the efficacy of rifle rounds that was pretty cool um and then check us out here guys if you're on youtube follow the channel subscribe share this stuff with your friends we don't just put this out because we want to be rich and famous because it does neither of those things we feel that this stuff is good for uh young and old men to listen to and hear we found some of these things out the hard way as such if you pass them on to your friends co-workers buddies etc it will help other people not have to find things out the hard way that actually if i write a book that's what it's going to be called the hard way <laughs> <laughs> be well you guys have a good day visit our website carrytrainer.com for information about classes held throughout the u.s Kerry Trainer Apparel and upcoming projects. You can also email us at training at carrytrainer.com for information about setting up your own private course or speaking engagement. Training at carrytrainer.com or carrytrainer.com.